You'll turn with me in your Bible to Habakkuk chapter 2. Where's Joanne? I'm going to tell them what you said because it was funny. Can I do that? Sure. <laughs> Joanne, Joanne comes, comes up to me and I'm in the office. She's got this look of excitement on her face. And she said, we've got a lot of people who are going to come and see you because you're so full of yourself when you're not drugged up and you want morphine. It's going to be great this morning. <laughs> and uh, I'm not on drugs. I'm a, I waited. I didn't want to preach under the influence. So I am drug free at the moment, but I will be hitting it as soon as I'm home today. Um, we had some college kids come over. And, uh, well, some of them are in college, some are not. And they were making fried bologna. I hadn't had that in a long time. I think last time I had that, we were at Dunn's and I had gotten a fried bologna burger. And I said, make me some of that. And they did. I ate not one, but two of those sandwiches. And the next day, there was bologna left over. We don't carry bologna in our house, because I believe make no provision for the flesh. <laughs> I said, well, since it's here and it's leftovers, might as well make a bologna and cheese lettuce sandwich. And um, after I ate that, things got unpleasant. <laughs> and I was sore, and I was hurting, and it kept getting worse. I came into the new members class. And right after that, I went to regional. And I know the stomach flu is going around too. So I said, maybe that's what this is. And, and it was so funny because they're doing the ultrasound. And the, and the girl's doing it and does this. <laughs> she starts hitting these pictures. And then she leaves the room. And she comes back. He says, turn over on your side, please. And there's somebody watching. I'm thinking, oh, this isn't good. And they got this concerned look. I said, is it good, bad, or ugly? She said, well, I really can't tell you. But we're getting in your x-ray right now. <laughs> and I'm thinking, this is not good. So she leaves me. We had a wonderful conversation. Her name was Erin. And Erin looks at me when she leaves. She goes, good luck. <laughs> and I'm thinking, this is not good. And... Uh, so then the x-ray technician comes in. She's all bouncy and bubbly. And she's talking about Beth and how wonderful things are. And she goes, okay, we're going to get some, go ahead and take some x-rays. So she goes and gets x-rays. And when she comes back, she's going, <laughs> she won't look at me. And I'm going, I've got cancer. I've got something bad's going on. I said, is this good, bad, or ugly? And she said, I, I can't discuss that. The surgeon, surgeon? <laughs> surgeon? And so I told Beth, I said, honey, it's something bad. So when they said gallstone, I was like, okay, it's all good. So it's a small one, and apparently it's stuck in the ductwork, and it hurts. And so it's okay right now. Um, I don't know if I had that mixed with stomach flu, because I think Beth's got that now. So I don't know. So I'm not on morphine, so if you came for the show, you might want to leave now. And, uh, but if you'll look with me at Habakkuk chapter 2, and uh, thank you all for your prayers and your concerns uh, Judy Strickland came up and said, I was concerned with you, you know, with the morphine. I said, oh, don't worry. That is wonderful. It is really wonderful. Um, you don't feel anything. You just kind of go la, la, la and go to sleep. It's wonderful. So just pray for me. We meet with the surgeon on Monday, and then we'll have a better game plan, and I'll let everybody know when we know what's going on. So uh, let's go, Lord, in prayer, and we'll get started. Father, I want to thank you so much for our church family. I want to thank you for all that you've been doing on behalf of your church. And uh, Father, I am constantly reminded every week that I am far from all that I need to be, but I am glad Jesus Christ is all he's promised that he is to be. And apart from him, we can do nothing. So, Father, just forgive us for thinking more highly of ourselves than we ought to. Uh, forgive us for thinking that apart from you, we can do anything. And I just pray that you would just bless the reading and the study of your word this morning to speak to each one exactly where they are and to encourage and convict and to challenge. But, Father, most importantly, to come to know you better. For that is eternal life, that we may know you and Jesus Christ, whom you sent. We thank you for the gift of eternal life. In Jesus' name we pray, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. I love stories, I love books, and I love movies. And there's some movies you can only watch once. 
not because they're horrible or not because they're just so painstakingly boring, but once you've seen it, you can never experience it the same way. What I mean is those movies that have that really twisted ending and all the truth hits you at one time and you realize that you've been wrong the entire movie. Um, the first people that I ever saw that, that did this well, first director, I should say, was Alfred Hitchcock. And I did not know this until this week that when Psycho came out, they were actually selling insurance in the movie theaters in case you died while you watched it. The greatest capitalism ploy in, in a lifetime. We're going to sell you life insurance. And they had very strict rules. Uh, you weren't allowed to enter the movie after it started, and you could not tell anybody what the ending was, and you were definitely not allowed to see the last 10 minutes. You had to see the whole movie. You could just watch the last 10 minutes. And it produced all this hype. And then at the end of the movie, I don't know if y'all have seen it. How many have seen it? I'm going to ruin it for you. Close your ears if you're going to watch it. I'm going to ruin it for you. When you find out his mother is him. What? Yeah. <laughs> you go, oh my gosh. Never saw it coming. Alfred Hitchcock was the king of that. Now, once you see the movie, it's no fun. There's no tension. There's no excitement. There's no mystery. You, all, you know how it's going to end. The only fun you can have is if you take someone else and not tell them and watch them struggle through it. <laughs> there was another director, and I have my favorite directors. There was another director that falls in the same school of thought, and he came out with a movie called Sixth Sense. Now, I'm, I'm going to ruin this if you haven't seen it. I'm ruining everything. Spoiler alert. Well, maybe I can share this without ruining it. I went with a friend who begged me to go. I'd given my life to Christ. I'm really not into horror movies anymore. And he says, Larry, you've got to see this movie. You've got to see this movie. It was Andrew Childers. And I said, I said Andrew, what? He said, Larry, you've just got to see this movie. So I'm watching the movie. The whole time I'm watching, I'm like, this is really bizarre. But the last five minutes of that movie, this is exactly what I did. I said it out loud in the theater. No way. And then when it set in, I went, no way, no way. And then I left going, you've got to see this movie. You've got to see it because the ending just, you realized you saw the whole movie wrong. You saw the entire movie wrong. It's all laid out there for you. So I went back to see it a second and a third time. The second time I went knowing what the ending was and it all makes more sense. You understand why they're reacting that way at the restaurant and why the window gets broken. You understand all these little intricacies, but the suspense and the surprise was gone. It's a one-time movie. You can only experience that one time. Last week, we were looking at Habakkuk, and he was praying. He's like, God, why are you doing this? Why is this evil coming in? And what God's going to do is answer Habakkuk's prayer by giving the ending away. He's going to give the ending away to Habakkuk of what's going to happen with this evil empire that's going to be judging Israel. And in chapter 3, what he's going to do is he's going to sing a hymn of praise, a song of praise. If you look at Habakkuk, he starts off questioning God, struggling with God, being honest with God. God's honest back to him. And Habakkuk, I believe, kind of did this. No way. No way. Let's look at God's answer in Habakkuk chapter 2. Habakkuk makes his plea that we looked at last week, and he's going to close his case. This is how he's going to end his dialogue with God, being very honest with God. I will stand my watch and set myself on the rampart. I will watch to see what he will say to me, and I will answer when I'm corrected. I'm back to saying my case is closed. It is wrong for God to use evil for his purposes, if you will. I can't believe we are evil. Yes, we are evil, God. But Babylon is more evil than us. And how are you going to use them to judge us? I don't understand this. Verse 2, God answers. This is what it says. Then the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain on tablets 
that he may run who reads it. Now, that's, re that's referring to whenever you had a good message, you had messengers that were runners that ran ahead. And that's what it's alluding to, that this is going to be a good news message. Verse 3, for the vision is yet for an appointed time. What I'm about to show you has been a, to be accomplished in an appointed time, Habakkuk. But at the end, it will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it. But it will surely come. It will not tarry. Now, in the book of Hebrews, the author of Hebrews uses that verse to refer to when Jesus is going to bring the end of evil in this world. That verse I just read you. Verse 4. Behold the proud. His soul is not upright in him. He's not right within himself or with me. But the just shall live by faith. A righteous man will live what I have said. They will believe me and trust me. And I am going to deal with evil. He's getting Habakkuk ready. The righteous will live by faith as they navigate this life. He who knows me, Habakkuk, knows I'm going to deal with this. So God is going to respond to this future evil. He says it's going to be in my time and in my way. I want you to notice something else. I just kind of skipped over this, but let's look at this. God said, I'm going to give you a vision, but at the end it will speak. There's often times in the Bible that God gave prophecies to prophets that they didn't understand until it happened. And God does that by design because it's not only building trust in God's Word, but when it comes to fruition, if you will, it is plain as black and white and you can see how all makes sense, just like in a, in a movie where you see the ending and it all ties together. This vision I'm going to give, he says, in the end it will talk. Here it is. You ready? Verse 5. Indeed, because he transgresses by wine, he's a proud man, and he does not uh, stay at home because he enlarges his desire as hell, and he is like death and cannot be satisfied. He gathers to himself all the nations and heaps up for himself all peoples. Will not all these take up a proverb against him and a taunting riddle against him and say? Now, what God is saying is this leader, and some believe this is talking about Nebuchadnezzar, some think it's talking about Babylon, but either way, what God is saying is what he's doing is going to come back on him. He thinks there's going to be no justice for his actions and his deeds, he needs to know, are going to be weighed out even though he doesn't think they're going to happen. He says they're going to take up a proverb, taunting riddle against him. And then he gives some woes. Here's the first one. Woe to him who increases what is not his. How long? And to him who loads himself with many pledges, will not your creditors rise up suddenly? Will, not, will they not awaken to those who oppress you and you will become their booty? Because you have plundered many nations. All the remnant of people shall plunder you because of men's blood and violence of the land and the city and all who dwelled in it. Verse 9, Woe to him who covets evil gain for his house, that he may set his nest on high, that he may be delivered from the power of disaster. He's saying they're putting their trust in, in the gains that he's made for himself, evil gain. Verse 10, You will give shameful counsel to your house, cutting off many peoples, the sin against your and sin against your soul. For the stone will cry out from the wall and the beam its timbers will answer it. So Babylon is increasing and what it's doing is it's going into places and taking over places and making gains for itself. It's building up its wealth. It's doing it by evil means. And God says, look, this is going to catch up with them too. This, ref this is going to cost them their soul and it's coming back. Listen, this isn't just to Babylon. This is for us as well. There are times, if we're going to be honest with ourselves, either we or people we know have used some dishonest ways to get gains for ourselves. And God says, when you do that, you hurt your own soul. And your very house will testify against you. For some people, money is the end of all things because it provides a security. If I have enough money, I will be what? <coughs> Secure. And that's where Babylon is. And God says, woe to him who covets evil. 
gain for his house. He moves from the house to the town. Verse 12, Woe to him who builds a town with bloodshed, who establishes a city by iniquity. Behold, is it not of the Lord of hosts that the peoples labor to feed the fire? That's a heavy verse. Let me put it in today's terms. Everything that you're earning, everything that you're working so hard for, everything you're investing is reserved for fire, is what the New Testament says. I've got a, a lot of nice things reserved for fire. My books reserved for fire. It's passing what? Away. And as we draw closer to Christ, the things of this world should be growing strangely dim. That's what it should be. But we kind of, let's just be honest, church. We kind of like our stuff. And everybody's got different stuff. Some of you got fishing rods that I don't know why you spent that much on them. They're fish. I was in a man's house last year that had a $1,200 rod. And let me tell you, it's nice. It's balanced. It's nice. And we go, I can't believe he'd spend that kind of money. Listen, some of y'all spend that kind of money on dogs. Or guns. Or worse yet, tools. <laughs> God says all the things we're laboring for is to feed the fire. Kind of gives us some perspective, doesn't it? The nations weary themselves in vain. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. And the waters cover the seas. That should be a reminder for us to store our treasure where? In heaven where moth and rust do not destroy. And thieves can't break in and steal. Verse 15. Woe to him who gives drink to his neighbor. Pressing him to your bottle. Even to make him drunk that you may look on his nakedness. You are filled with shame instead of glory. You also drink and be exposed as uncircumcised. The cup of the Lord's right hand will be turned against you and utter shame will be your glory. For the violence done to Lebanon will cover you. Now let me tell you what's going on. They, they had a party spirit about them. When I say a party spirit, that doesn't mean a demon that makes them want to party. That means they liked the party and they had that spirit about them. So we just get that cleared up. And what they're talking about, if you're a red-blooded male, you know exactly what he's talking about. Girls think you're prettier if they're drinking a little bit. It's the truth. You may not want to hear it, but it's the truth. And some ladies and men both, we can get them to drink enough. I might be able to what? That's what it's talking about. That's exactly what it's talking about. Pressing him to the body. Oh, just take a drink. Come on, it's just one drink. Come on, just one. <laughs> Even to make him drunk. Why are they getting you drunk? Think about that. Are they looking out for you? That they may look on his nakedness. And then God says, you are filled with shame instead of glory. That's actually going to be Babylon's downfall. It's going to be at one of these parties, and they're going to be getting ready to party it up. And they go, hey, I tell you what, we've been drinking out of these. Go get those, go get those utensils from, from the temple, from God's temple, the Jews' temple. We'll drink out of those. Let's party right. And that's the day that the finger wrote on the wall. You have been weighed out. And that night, just as God will prophesy, the empire falls. When it talks about the Lebanon, the violence of Lebanon here, let me tell you what they would do when they would come into a, a place. They would totally annihilate it and destroy it. Sadly, uh, and this is still a practice even in the East today. When you came into a territory, you would take the women by force, intimately. Then that way they were damaged goods to the people that were there. 
and march your territory. They would abuse the children and send them to slavery. They would kill the men and the ones they could control, they would slave. And then this is what Babylon would do. They would come in and tear down all the vegetation, all of it. Cut down all the trees, all the vegetation, and then they would sow the land with salt. What would happen to the land? They just totally destroy it. And God says, because of this, for the violence done to Lebanon will cover you. It's going to come back on you. And the plunder of beasts which made them afraid because of men's blood and the violence of the land and the city and all who dwell in it. What profit is the image and its maker should carve it? The molded image and the teacher of lies. The maker of its mold should trust in it to make mute idols. Woe to him who says to wood, awake. To silent stone arise, it shall teach. Behold, it is overlaid with gold and silver, yet in it there is no breath at all. But the Lord is in His holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before Him. When we read that, it's very encrypted, if you will. But looking back, you can see exactly these are the things that will happen to Babylon. They are going to fall, and He's revealed this to Habakkuk. He is saying to Habakkuk during this whole time we've studied this, Israel is definitely wicked. And Israel's doing some of the same things Babylon's doing. So I'm going to raise up Babylon as a paddle to spank you. And when I'm done spanking you with this paddle and you learn your lesson, they're going to fall. And Habakkuk, you need to understand something. You just need to be silent before me. Um, we were talking about court in the college and career class. And I don't know if you've ever been on a judge's stand or in court in that place. Uh, the joke in our household is all the times I should have been in court growing up, I wasn't. And then after I go into ministry, I'm in court, court a lot. Either to testify or to share something or for other reasons. It is a scary thing to be in front of a judge who has all control and power. And it amazes me the arrogance of people who come in like they're going to tell the judge something. You're stupid, man. You don't even know what you're doing. Oh, that's helping you out. Right, right. Yeah. Got you two extra months. Keep going, bud. There's no fear. Here, listen. There's no fear of justice. And Babylon had no fear of justice coming. They were untouchable. They could go in and do what they want. They could sweep in and take everything over. They could rise up and come against people without any stop. And the thing that Habakkuk's struggling is, God said, I raised them up. In the New Testament it says there's no authority that is established that God doesn't put into place. We have a problem with that just like Habakkuk does. But God doesn't leave him there. He says, just as I'm going to raise them up, they're going to learn a lesson too because I am going to deal with evil because I am a just judge. And the entire world is going to stand silent before me. As a husband, if me and my wife are in some sort of disagreement, if I feel I can win the argument or she's wrong, I stand my ground pretty well. However, if she's right, and I know she's right, and she knows that she's right, <laughs> I just kind of, you can ask her, I will sit silent. Because there's really no what? Argument. I kind of go, okay. That's what God's saying. Habakkuk, let the whole earth keep silent before him guilty the Bible says this the Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some count slackness but is long suffering toward us not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance part of the reason God takes so long to do things is because he's doing something we cannot see and even dealing with evil, we wonder why isn't it happening faster? 
Because God has a bigger overall picture, and that is to seek and to save that which is lost. And it's his desire that all come to repentance. He goes on to say in that same verse I just read you, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with a fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for the hastening of the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat? Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for the new heavens and the new earth in which righteousness dwells. Justice is coming. And this is the problem we have. I get little bumps on my phone from WWBT12 and different news organizations. I've been shocked at how many teenagers have been going missing. And I looked at one, and they found this and found that. And I'm thinking, God, why did this happen? And we want that evil punished immediately. We want somebody that kidnaps a little child and does some horrific things to them punished immediately. But our gossip, eh, not so much. That's not quite as what? Evil. We want the murderer to get it instantly. But when I slander somebody, well, we need to let that slide. See, the issue with evil really isn't different levels of evil. Is is God going to deal with all of it or just part of it? He's going to deal with all of it. And he's being patient Let me read it to you again. He's not slack concerning his promise. He is going to deal with all of it, just like Habakkuk. In in my time, you'll see it. Wait for it. God even says that. Wait for it. As some count slackness, but as long-suffering. Another translation, but as patient toward us, not willing that any should perish, but it all should come to repentance. I had somebody uh, on the phone this week call me from uh, out of state, and we were talking about Revelation. And he said, what was the greatest thing you got out of Revelation? I say, here's the greatest thing I got out of Revelation. The tremendous, furious love of God. He said, explain that to me. I said, I'll explain it to you. The world turns on God and destroys his people, Christians. So you know what God does? He raises up. 144 witnesses to spread the gospel throughout the world. The world turns on them. So you know what? God sends two witnesses, supernatural, powerful witnesses. They come to witness to the whole world. The world turns on them and kills them and has such a celebration of death, it's it's Christmas Day. They're exchanging presents and celebrating their death. God raised them up from the dead. They still won't repent and they turn on them. So you know what God does? He sends three angels with three messages. The first angel from the heavens to the entire earth sharing the gospel message. The furious love of God. If I were God and they were doing that to my people, but not God. He is patient toward us, not willing that any should perish. I love the verse that talked about the angel. Then I saw an angel flying in the midst of heaven, having an everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, preaching to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Let me ask you a question. Did God love Israel? Did God love Babylon? Yes. I spent this past week studying the theodicy. I try not to study that stuff too much. It makes my brain hurt. They've been arguing about this since the beginning of time. And that's a big fancy word that means where did evil come from? Who's responsible for it? It's the study of God and the justice of God is really what that word means. And you know what I found out? Nobody really had a good answer. Nobody. Everybody thought they had the right answer, and everybody thought they were right, and everybody else was wrong. But when you really sat down and weigh it out, there's really not a good answer. If you're here saying, I've got a good answer, you haven't studied it enough. 
I heard one man who's my hero, who was one of my heroes, he said this, God did not create evil, but he did not prevent it. It occurred uh, in the rebellion against him. And, and he's right, John MacArthur said that, God did not create it, but it did, he did not prevent it. It occurred in a rebellion against him. The first sign of evil we see is when Satan decided, I'm not going to do it God's way anymore. I'm going to do it my way, and he makes a choice. And God takes evil things and wields them for His own purposes. Sometimes it's for chastening and dis discipline. Sometimes it's to humble people. I don't know if you've ever thought about this. God even allowed Satan to, to be turned loose on Job, who was a very righteous man, for a divine purpose. But Satan had to get permission before he did any of that. There's a place even in the New Testament where Satan comes and Jesus at the Lord's Supper and says, Peter, Satan's asked to sift you like wheat. And I wish Peter said, you told him no, right? But Jesus didn't give him time to ask a question. He said, but don't worry, I've prayed for you that after that time, you'll be able to use what you learn to restore those. And God had divine purpose in that. But Satan had to ask him what? Permission. We talked about last week in Paul's life that satanic messenger, and Paul prayed to have it removed, and God said, no, my grace is sufficient. There is evil in the world. Amen or oh me. And for a Christian this is a very this is a, it's a tough question because there's physical evil that we see in the world through plagues and disease and disasters and things like that that we just know are evil. There's a moral evil and the Bible is very clear that man has this evil. Let no one say when he's tempted I am tempted by God, for God is, cannot be tempted by evil, nor does himself tempt anyone, but each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when those desires have conceived, it gives birth to sin, and to sin when it's full grown brings death. And we all know we have this, this choice. Do we follow God and conform to his standards and his righteousness, or do we do what we want to do? Matter of fact, the evil that we see in marriages as they fall apart and wars and fighting, murders and kidnapping and gossip and lying. is man choosing to do what he wants to do. Everybody I studied agreed with that. They disagree on how much and this and real technical splitting of hairs. But we can either, doesn't God say choose this day whom you will and we either, even for the Christian, we can be a slave to sin or a slave to righteousness. I want you to think about it. Think of all the evil you can think in the world. What you think is evil. Is that what men do to other men? The kidnapping of a little kid? That is a man saying, I do not care what God says. I'm going to do what I want to do. Someone that takes a baby from a mom... I don't care what that's going to do to her and her family. I'm only thinking about a wife comes home and finds out her husband's been lying and having an affair. Has that husband been worried about his wife and his kids or just worried about what he wants? Moral evil. There's also demonic evil, a supernatural evil, spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. And they exploit this world and the corruption within us. There's all kinds of evil. And I, seriously, I've listened this week since I was sick. I've listened to pastors, read Puritans, Lutherans, Pentecostals, Methodists, Arminians, Calvins, Calvinists, Monalism, Calvinism, Arminianism. And they're all trying to answer this question about God and evil. And all of them, all of them, I am right, everybody else is there's a pride there. There was one that I found that was a little refreshing. He used the Bible to answer the question and he says, but you know the truth is God doesn't tell us and therefore we should not guess. And if I could have gone through the, the radio, I'd have done this. A man who's honest, he doesn't need to know everything. 
See, God is holy. God is powerful. God is all-knowing. God is all-loving. And there's some people who say, well, if God is all-powerful, all-knowing, and all-loving, and if He can't stop evil, then He must not be God. Because if He's all-powerful, then He must not be loving. If He's loving and He can't stop evil, He must not be. And they come up with all these excuses. God really doesn't know everything. He isn't all-powerful. He isn't loving. What God wants us to do is not try to figure out the answer to that question. They've been arguing over that since Aquinas and Augustine. The early church didn't argue about it a whole lot. They had a way of dealing with it they don't even talk about it anymore today, sadly. What God tells us to do is focus on me. Watch how easy this is, church. Is God all loving? Yes. Is He all powerful? Yes. Is He all present? Yes. Is He all wise? Yes. Is there some things that God, trick question, are there some things God can't do? Yes, there are some things God can't do. He can't lie, He can't not know. Tricked you. And if God can't lie and He says, I am going to deal with evil and you need to trust me and I am all-knowing and all-loving and all-powerful and all-wise, can you trust me with this? That's why Habakkuk's going to sing next week. Doesn't God tell us this about evil? I will work all things together for a... Say it with me, church. We'll work all things together for a... Good... He's going to work it all together. Now let me share how, how this is going to work together. Habakkuk didn't know this. We do. Because this happens, Daniel is going to be taken from his family against his will to Babylon. Because Daniel is taken to Babylon, he's going to fall in good graces with the king, Nebuchadnezzar. And though he lives a, a very holy, set-apart life, he is persecuted and challenge, and yet God shows himself strong. And because of Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar is going to end up giving his life to God and glorifying him. Not only that, a lot of people in the kingdom. And we know this from history that Daniel, we really do believe this, is the one that starts this little school of prophets that the wise men who come to seek Christ come from. Because Babylon's going to do this, the Jews can no longer worship in the temple, so they're going to set up something that had never been heard of before called the synagogues. And because of the synagogues, the Jewish traditions and faith are going to start to spread throughout the land so that when Jesus Christ comes on the scene, the gospel is able to spread like wildfire. And you start to look at all the little things, the good things that happen because of this bad thing, you go, man, God must know what He's doing. He's going to fulfill God's Word in numerous ways that were given hundreds of years beforehand. And listen, Israel will no longer worship idols. Lesson will be learned. And Habakkuk sings. Let me share this as we close. There are times that I hear people say, I don't know why God doesn't deal with the evil in the world. He is, and He's going to, just like with Habakkuk. What we forget is what God's definition of evil is. On a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being the worst and 1 being the best. Murder, scale of 1 to 10, how far? 10. Gossip, 1 to 10. Yeah, it is 10. Homosexuality, 10. Slander. 10. We don't do that though, do we? We go, that's gossip and slander is a 1. Those sins are 10. Kidnapping, oh, that's a, that's a horrible sin, but just looking lustfully at other women, that's not that bad. God gave us eyes, right, man? No, God says all of it is evil. Jesus even says this to us. You who are evil who give good gifts to your children. Look at Joey Reinhardt over there. Evil. <laughs> Evil. Why do you say that, Larry? 
because he gives good gifts to his children. And when Jesus is sharing that, he's saying this, Joe, you've got a problem. You're a good dad. You give good things to your children. But when God looks at him and looks at me, he sees an evil. Because evil is an activity that comes from an attitude of I don't need God. I can do what I want to do when I want to do it. I don't care what God thinks. Oh, I know he says not to gossip, but it's so much fun and shh, it's no big deal. Hey, I, I'm not cheating on my wife. You know, I can look at the dessert menu. God doesn't care. What we're really saying is, God, your standards are really kind of crazy, stupid. I'll set my own standards and live by that. You don't bother me. I won't bother you. And God says that attitude is evil. I know what's best for you. I know what's going to prosper you and help you to thrive I made you. I know how you're supposed to operate, and this is not the way it's going to be. And so God has to deal with the evil in our life. And he's going to deal with it one of two ways. One way is we'll go to court, and we will stand silent before him, and every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess. And he will look at our track record, both our good deeds and our bad, and we will be examined in a court of law and be found wanting and that will be the end for us. And he will look and say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. And we will pay for the crimes we've committed. We don't think about that. We will spend eternity paying for our crimes because that's what they're worth. That's the first way. Here's the second way. God goes, you're in a pickle you can't get out of and you've got a debt you can't pay for, I'm going to send somebody to pay for your debt. I'm going to send my son to die for your evil, to die for your sins, to die for your selfishness. He will die in your place, and if you accept that by faith, I'll forgive you your debt. God is going to deal with evil, but God's already dealt with it on the cross. And there will be those who accept it and put their faith in him and receive eternal life in a relationship with him. There will be others that will just kind of blow it off and will stand before court and judge. And they will stand silent before God. Does that make sense, church? The reason Habakkuk is going to sin, sing next week is because he's seeing the awesomeness of God and how he's working. He's seeing the love of God and the goodness of God. And next week we're going to learn all about God what he learned through the midst of this bad. Does that make sense, church? The love of God is a furious, wonderful thing. He will do everything in his power to reach out and pull you to himself. But the judgment and wrath of God is a fearful thing. And he will do that just as furiously as well. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we forget how evil sin is. Father, we forget that our heart is deceptively, deceivingly wicked. Father, we forget that we think often more of ourselves than we do you or others. Father, even when we do our acts of righteousness, you say they're like filthy rags because we are doing them with twisted motives. Sin has twisted us and broken us and blinded us. And so, Father, you are going to deal with the sin in our life. You've already dealt with it on the cross. And I pray, Father, we would receive that wonderful gift of forgiveness and salvation that we can be justified and declared debt-free. And more importantly than just the forgiveness, having a relationship with you where you're real to us. We talk to you and you show yourself strong on our behalf even when we don't even understand why. Father, there's some that are just going to reject that. They're going to reject you and they're going to stand before you at the great white throne judgment and it's not going to be pretty. Father, I pray that none of us would be on the side 
on the other side, Father, of that judgment seat. Your word promises no condemnation for those that are in Christ. Those you set free are free indeed. And so, Father, I pray that you would just help us to see that evil will be dealt with, to trust you in your goodness, that you know what you're doing, but to be thankful every day that you don't deal with the evil that we have in our life. Thank you for your forgiveness, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Our hymn of invitation this morning's hymn, 344. And you might be here today saying, you know, I need to receive that gift. You come up here, we'll get that straight today. But you do what the Lord leads you to do this morning.